Is it possible to revolutionize a mundane industry through the power of highly scalable applications? What strategies and secrets lie behind the creation of a groundbreaking app that propels a seemingly unexciting sector into the realm of innovation? Embark on a journey with me as I uncover the transformative potential and find the hidden opportunities within the world of boring industries demonstrating how building a highly scalable app can breathe new life into any field, leaving a lasting impact on both business and consumers alike. Welcome to Biz Help For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. But there always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here's your host, Candy Messer. Hello and welcome to Biz Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining me today. If you missed my last episode and would like to listen to the show, links can be found on my social media pages, as well as multiple favorite podcast platforms. And if you'd like to receive notifications on when my podcasts have been uploaded, please like and subscribe. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my guest today. Brian Clayton is CEO and co-founder of GreenPal, an online marketplace that connects homeowners with local lawn care professionals. GreenPal has been called the Uber for Lawn Care by Entrepreneur Magazine and has over 200,000 active users, completing thousands of transactions per day. Before starting GreenPal, Brian Clayton founded Peachtree Inc., one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, growing it to over $10 million a year in annual revenue before it was acquired by Lusa Holdings in 2013. Brian's interest and expertise are related to entrepreneurialism, small business growth, marketing, and bootstrapping businesses from zero revenue to profitability and exit. So Brian, welcome to the show. Candy, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. I am looking forward to this conversation. I haven't had a discussion yet on app development, and I think it's going to be very interesting uh, for people to hear. But before we get into questions that I have for you on that topic, I'd love for you to tell me just a little bit more about your journey into your entrepreneurial success. Yeah, so great introduction. Thanks for that. I am the CEO <laughs> and co-founder of GreenPal. So GreenPal is a mobile app that works like Uber, but for lawn care services. So if you are a homeowner, need to get a grass cutting service rather than calling around on Craigslist or something like that, you just download GreenPal, pop your address in, you'll get four or five quotes back from lawn care services nearby you, and then you can hire one through the touch of a button. They'll come out and take care of the chore for you. And it it's like ordering something off of Amazon or Instacart or DoorDash or Uber, but for one thing, lawn maintenance. And GreenPal is a 10 year overnight success. My two co-founders and I have been at the business for over a decade. And now we're nationwide in the United States, 300,000 people using the app every day to get their grass cut. And it's been a heck of a journey getting this marketplace going and getting the mobile app built and figuring out what buyers and sellers need and little by little entering our way towards success. But GreenPal, before, before I started GreenPal, I actually had a landscaping business, believe it or not. I, I ran a, a lawn mowing business for 15 years, grew it to $10 million a year, and sold it in 2013. So I used everything I learned from building that business to starting GreenPal. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I love that you said, too, it was a 10-year overnight success, right? A lot of times people think, oh, I'm going to start a business. This is going to happen, and I'm just going to be rich tomorrow, right? But it takes a lot mm -hmm. of work. So I'm glad that you actually mentioned that. But how does a traditional business transform into an app? Yeah. So for me, I was kind of solving my own problem when I started GreenPal. I spent 15 years in the business running a lawn care company. And I saw all the ways that it was inefficient, that it needed fixing, all of the ways that technology could make it run smoother. And I thought, well, somebody's going to build the platform, a marketplace to, to make this run a lot smoother. It might as well be me. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of naivete as an asset. 
I didn't really understand how hard it was going to be, but it was good because if I had known how challenging it would be to, to get this mobile app off the ground, I probably would have never done it. And I think the one thing I didn't know, I didn't really understand was if there's a big difference between running a traditional business versus inventing a brand new product from scratch. And so my first company was a landscaping company, very much a blue collar hand to hand combat rubber meets the road kind of business. And it was really challenging to grow and scale and sell that company. And after I did all that, I thought I knew everything there was to know about company building. And, and I quickly learned that I didn't really know the first thing about how to invent the new product. And so that was very surprising that it was really challenging inventing the product that makes it all run smoothly and like magic. And I think anybody that is in the technology business that is going to be bringing a new piece of technology to the marketplace usually is inventing a new product from scratch. And so that's the thing that most folks don't know. It's the thing that I didn't really understand the dynamics of that when you're inventing a new product, that's 10 times harder than any sort of traditional business. But mm -hmm. you just kind of inch your way to success by going from failure to failure, learning from what doesn't work and improving it and figuring out what problems people have and what, what you can solve with technology. Mm -hmm. And I can assume that that would be actually kind of expensive because you're paying either if you don't know how to develop an app, you're paying a developer to do that and all the ins and outs and finding what works and doesn't work, you know? So like, what is a typical investment someone might look for? And then how did you actually fund that development as well? Great question. So you're right. It is expensive to to build a, a new piece of technology because it's a hard skill. Not a whole lot of people know how to code up a mobile app or code up a website or build a piece of software. And so you have to pay highly skilled people to do that. And that's the first thing we did when we started GreenPal. We thought, okay, well, we don't know how to build software. We've never done that before. So we'll outsource all that. We'll hire a development shop to build what we think Green Pal should be, and then we'll market it and we'll just be off and going. And so that's what we did. And we pulled together all of our money and spent $150,000 with a development shop in Nashville, Tennessee to build what we thought Green Pal should be. And we did that and released the product into the marketplace and it was a total failure. It was dead <laughs> on arrival. It, just didn't have the features it needed, didn't work like we thought it should. People hated it that tried it. They told us everywhere that it sucked and that we let them down. But there was two things we learned. The first was when they tried it and hated it, they told us everywhere it lacked and where it needed improvement, but they never said they didn't need it. And they never mm -hmm. said that, that I don't want this. In fact, they were disappointed that it didn't work the way they thought it should. So that was validation that we were on the right path to building something that people wanted. The second thing we learned was to be in the technology business, you have to know how to build software. You have to learn how to code. You have to have these skills. You have to be a builder. And so we had to learn how to build software, took online, we had to go back to the drawing board and reinvent ourselves as tech entrepreneurs. And, and so go to YouTube University, take online classes, go to software boot camps, things like that. And so we, we did that, my two co-founders and I. And it took like three years, three years to learn how to build software, learn how to become developers, and then rebuild the whole platform ourselves with the skills we were learning along the way. And looking back, trying to start a tech company without the ability to build a tech company is kind of like saying... You know, I have an idea for a new rock song or I have a, a new idea for a new pop song. I just need to hire a musician mm -hmm. or saying I want to start a new restaurant and I need to hire a chef. You know, I don't know the first thing about about how to cook, you know, and mm -hmm. so it really was like a hard reality we had to face that we had to learn how to become tech entrepreneurs to be in the game. Mm -hmm. Well, I would think that would be really difficult because especially if you're still running a business that maybe you want to have an app for it, right? You know, and you're not a technology genius that you would want to be finding someone who could actually help you with that. So if someone doesn't have the time to learn, like you did and invest three years and, you know, the amount of money to even become that app developer themselves, like, do you have any tips on how to find someone that could help them and how do they figure out pricing? Do they just have a project budget? Is it so much per hour? Like, what are those kind of things that need to be taken into consideration? 
Yeah, I think let's say you want to bring a new piece of technology to the marketplace and it's tech adjacent. It's not like technology is is not at the heart of what you do. Like let's say you have a I don't know, a bakery and you want to have a way for customers to order baked goods for large events like weddings, wedding cakes or something like that. And you want to create like a wedding cake builder and you want to have like the best wedding cake builder on the market. And you're going to use that to better serve your customers. I don't know. I just made that up. (laughs) Well, in that case, like the wedding cake builder and things like that, you could probably outsource that and probably be okay and probably get through it just by trial and error. Because at the heart of what you do is the recipes for the wedding cakes and fulfilling the orders that customers make. And the technology is kind of sprinkled on top. And I think it can work there and it can help for you to still train yourself on some of like maybe the 80, 20 on what it means to integrate software and and technology into your business. But do you need to learn how to code? Probably not. You probably still need to figure out the recipe for the best wedding cake (laughs) in your market. So that said, just depends on how much technology we're talking about. But if you like, let's say you're in the wedding cake business and you decide, I don't want to be in the baking business anymore. Running this bakery sucks. And I hate having to like have flour all over me all the time. And I I really want to be in the technology business. And I want to build a marketplace that connects people who are getting married with wedding cake vendors and wedding dressmakers. And like, so I want to build a marketplace that is fully a technological solution to all of these people's problems. I think you're going to have to be in the software building business. I don't see any other way to not to be able to pull that off if you don't know how to build software. That Mm -hmm. said, let's say your right-hand man or your right-hand woman is a coder. Is So ideally, you get what's called a hacker and a hustler. So you get get like somebody who's just a driven, business-oriented person, salesperson. Maybe they're a designer. Maybe they are the business brains behind it like a Steve Jobs and a, and a Steve Wozniak. And you get these two minds together and, and one plus one is three or something like that. Then that can help. And then so that the hacker, so to speak, of the team is like focused on the technology side and is, is executing all that while the hustler is getting the business going from scratch. That can work. But then you might say, well, I don't know any hackers and, and I, don't, I don't know any people that know how to code. And so what do I do? I think you kind of have to like, you have to be so good that somebody would want to join your mission. And so you Hmm. would have to like, let's say you weren't going to learn how to build software and you weren't going to do it yourself. You're going to try to attract a technical co-founder. You would still be working seven days a week. You would still be taking classes on this stuff. You would still be like getting it to as far as you could. And you would be like hand cranking everything, but the technology to where somebody who did know how to build software would look at you and say, that person is an animal. I want to join Hmm. their cause. And so you would have to like attract that type of person to your cause is mm-hmm. the only way I know how to do it. But just trying to outsource this stuff while building a new piece of technology, it really is a fool's errand. It's going to waste two or three years of your life and maybe all of your life savings because <laughs> mm-hmm. it almost did me. <laughs> well, that's a great tip because there may be people thinking how they could just I'll find someone that will help do all this. And so I think just sharing your experience, right? Will open some it. eyes maybe is <laughs> yeah. what, what to do. Don't do it. The, the analogy is, it really is. I have an idea for a song. I need to find a musician mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be the next big rock star. And I have an idea for a song and I don't know how to play the guitar and I, and I can't sing. So I just need to find right. a musician. Like how silly <laughs> does that sound? Right. Right. Well, that's like, I have an idea for an app, but I don't know how to code. I just need to find a coder. Mm -hmm. Like that's literally what it is. Mm -hmm. And then once you have it, so you had talked before you had an app, you, you know, put it in the market and you had this feedback that it wasn't great, you know? So first of all, I guess my one question is how do you even get it available to the market where they can find it? You could get the word out, you know, look in the app store, you know, how is it even in the app store? And then how do you find those people who are willing to test it for you and give you that feedback so you can make those improvements? Great question. So and this is a mistake that I made and a lot of people make this mistake also. They think that the hard part is building the app. <laughs> it's like, you okay, well, now I've got the app built. I learned how to code or I got a technical co-founder and we've got this app built. Whew, that was hard. 
I'm so glad that we're done and that now we're <laughs> we're off and going. And then you realize that that was the easy part. The hard part is actually getting people to use it and getting people to understand that it exists and getting people to know about it and begging people to use it. And so let's go back to the music metaphor again. Let's say you learned how to play the guitar really good and you became a composer and you learned how to write songs, you took classes on songwriting or whatever. And, and that was so inspiring that you got somebody who's a rock star vocalist to join your band. And now you've got a, you, you guys made an album. And like you spent three years and like you've created this thing, you poured your soul into it. And now you come to realize that the hard part is actually getting people to come to your live shows, getting people <laughs> to actually buy your album. You come to understand that really anybody can cut an album and anybody can write some songs and anybody can like book a concert. The hard part is getting people to buy the album and show up to the show. Well, that's exactly what building an app is like. It's exactly like that. So that's where you, where we were, you know, three years in, we were like, okay, we've learned how to code. We learned how to build this thing. Now we can't, how do we get people to use this? And, and the, the only thing we knew to do was to pass out flyers. Hmm. Similarly, if you had a band, you might stand outside the concert venue and pass out flyers, trying to get a hundred people to show up your first hundred fans. And so for us, we had to get our first hundred customers. And we did it by passing out door hangers all over Nashville, Tennessee, until we got 100 people to try it out. And we begged every one of those people to meet with us and tell us everywhere they thought the app needed improvement, what they wish it would do that it didn't do, what we needed to focus our time on. And so we just kept doing that. And we, we kept focusing on making it better and better on what the two or three things that needed to be fixed were at any given time. And because now we had the skills to improve it ourselves, we could, we, we became builders, mm -hmm. did that little by little, trying to turn a hundred into a thousand. We wanted to get a thousand customers. We got a hundred in our first year. Now we wanted to turn it into a thousand. And, and we began to understand that we had to learn digital marketing and learn how to get the products to rank well and search engines. Like if somebody was looking for a lawn mowing service in Nashville or Lincoln, Nebraska, or Atlanta, Georgia, or Sacramento, California, how do we pop up in the list of things for them to consider? And that began to be like a whole nother journey. Like, how, like how do you rank well amongst all these competitors and began to peel the layers away of how, how to do that and execute a plan against that. So it's very much like a video game almost. You solve one level at a time, you, you conquer one dragon and then, then you start the next level and it's a whole nother mountaintop. You got to climb a whole nother final boss. And I think what holds up a lot of new founders is, is they're worried about Bowser, you know, when they're really on level one and you <laughs> just need to work on one level at a time and, and really not get sidetracked by anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, and I heard you saying, you know, you basically were going door to door and spreading the word that way. But if you're going door to door saying, I have an app, like, how did you even have it like available? So like, okay, I'm going to pull out my phone. I'm interested. Yes. I'm going to, you know, get your application. Like, how do you even have it available for them that way? Yeah. So two things we did spend 150 grand with a development shop to build something. And so that something like didn't really fulfill the, the promise of push a button lawn care service shows up, but it got you maybe halfway there. It, it would get you quotes and, and then like the rest, we would have to hand crank in the background. Like we would have to call the service provider and say, Hey, you know, you got hired by Mrs. Smith. You need to be out there on Thursday. And then on Thursday we'd call them back. Hey, did you show up and send us the pictures of the completed works? We can email it to them. So we would like hand crank the experience, like all of the magic behind the scenes rather than software, it would be us doing it. Mm. So we at least had that. And so we would pass out door hangers and literally hang, we probably passed out half a million door hangers that we had printed up at vistaprint.com and got awareness about, hey, did your lawn care service ghost you? Hire a lawn mowing service with, with Green Pal in 30 seconds for under $50, even if your grass is four feet tall. You know, some kind of compelling value proposition that you couldn't say no to. And we would get like a whole 0.0001% response rate. But it was what we had to do at that level of the game to get 100 people to try it because we needed to get to 100. We needed to get 100 people to use it, give us feedback. So then we knew like all of these things we were hand cranking, we needed like the liquidity of people trying it to use it to then understand what we needed to build. 
Hmm. A mistake a lot of new founders make is they don't do any of that and they try to solve for a thousand or 10,000 customers and everything they build is based on their assumptions mm -hmm. and their logic, their perception of the problems that they're solving in the marketplace. It's not based in actual customer feedback. And what you want to do is shorten the time between where you're at today and a dozen people using it, telling you where you need to improve, what needs to be fixed and, and where you need to focus your efforts. Because if not, you're just working off of assumptions and one of two things is going to happen. You're either going, you're going to get really lucky or you're going to like be wrong. And, and, and most of the time you're just wrong. The way you see the problem is not the way customers see the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So that feedback is extremely important, right? To be able to have. And so I would assume then at that case, if there's normally maybe a fee to use something that you're going to say, we're going to let you use this. And, you know, in return, we would love to have your feedback. And then as it's being improved, if there becomes, you know, a fee, maybe then they're grandfathered in or something. But, you know, I think that's probably from just my perception of what it would take to be able to get users willing to even try it and let you know what they think. Possibly, but it depends, I think maybe a, a reduced fee or something like that to entice people to use it. The problem is, is if you give it away and you don't charge a fee, then how do you know you're actually solving a problem that people are willing to pay for? Mm, and, and that can send you down a path of you're working on something that you're not monetizing. You're not, you're not getting any money for. And, and I mean, there's a lot of cases where this, this strategy has worked, but it can be dangerous because then you spend a year working on something and then the minute you try to charge for it, ah, no thanks. And so now right. you've wasted a year of your life. And so be careful of that. <laughs> what you want is like the fully baked, like what it costs offering. I'm putting my credit card number down. I want this. And then what you do as the founder is, is like the Wizard of Oz technique where you're hand cranking everything behind the scenes like a duck almost above the surface, calm, below the right. water. You're just paddling your ass off. And you're like making, you, you, yeah, it's not profitable, but you know that eventually like everything that you're doing feverishly below the surface, behind the scenes can be automated away through technology and that you just need time to build all of that. And you need the, the feedback from a few hundred people to know what to build. That mm -hmm. to me is a, is a better bet. Mm-hmm. Right. So in terms of pricing, then, do you have a recommendation of how to even price an app? Yeah. You know, for us, it was pretty straightforward. We were just going to take a, a percentage of the transaction. And so our customer is actually the lawn care service that uses the mm -hmm. platform because they pay a percentage of the, of the fee. And so how do we know what percentage to charge? It's hard. And, and a lot of times, you know, it's experimentation. You pick a number based off of all of your best guesses, best assumptions, and then you can experiment high or low. Okay, well, if I raise it, does that cause people to abandon the platform? Does it cause people not to sign up? If I lower it, do I get more people in the front door, but then I don't make enough money to cover my costs? And so a lot of times, you know, there is no silver bullet for knowing how much exactly to charge. Other than, in my, in my opinion, start charging day one and draw a line in this and then start experimenting high and low. Cause you really don't know, especially if mm -hmm. it's a, if it's a brand new product, but to have the courage, a lot of new founders don't have the courage to raise their price or to charge enough. And so then they get stuck in this trap of not charging enough. They don't make enough money. And then there's no gas, there's no fuel for the, for the business to grow. So I think a lot of mm -hmm. times it's talk to your first customers, start charging day one, make your best guess, then experiment. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, I know we're coming to the end of the time that we have together. So I wanted to let you share how listeners can connect with you if they have more questions on this topic. Yeah, sure. Anybody listening to this that doesn't want to waste time mowing your own yard, just go to greenpal.com, sign up, you'll get free quotes. And anybody that wants to hit me up, just drop me a DM on Instagram, Brian M. Clayton, and I'll respond to you there. Perfect. Well, thank you, Brian, for being a guest on my show and talking about this. It's an interesting concept, thinking about turning a business you know, into an app. And I know you were saying in the introduction and in your bio that it's 
a boring industry that can have an app. It's, I can see this across the board all over the place, but it was an interesting conversation. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Candy. Thanks for having me on. Thank you listeners for tuning in today. I hope you found this topic interesting and enjoyed the informative discussion. Would you please share my show with those you know and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform? I'd really appreciate your support. If you have any additional questions or comments, be sure to reach out to my guest at any of the links that they shared, or you could send me a message at media at abandp.com. I hope you can join me for my next interview. And remember, you can connect with me on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And my website is abandp.com. This episode is sponsored by Affordable Bookkeeping and Payroll Services. If you are overwhelmed trying to handle the financial aspects of your business, ABMP is here to help. Contact us today to discuss your needs at 310-534-5577 or contact at abandp.com. My team and I are eager to assist you. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you for listening to Biz Help For You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next time. Have a terrific day.